Even if it is. <coughs> Thank you. Let's make this nice and professional like. Okay, uh, welcome to the uh, um, 2600 meetings, a valuable resource or a waste of time. I also want to officially welcome everybody to Hope Number 6. It's going very well so far and good to see you all here. Hope you're having fun. Hope you stay all night, all weekend. I want to announce there's a, uh, there's a party tonight, too. Uh, everyone is meeting at 11 o'clock at the info desk on the second floor, and they're all going over to Mustang Harry's, so keep that in mind. You sure it's not Mustang Sally's? No, it's Mustang Harry's. All right, I was going to go to Mustang Sally's. Sally is Harry, but There's a lot of Mustangs whatever. around here. <coughs> okay, I uh, just want to introduce uh, the panel number 117 over at the end there, um, otherwise known as Rop uh, from Holland who's here. Uh, number 84, Lexicon. Uh, number 134, Bernie S. Uh, me. Number 6. Uh, Jeopardy Jim, number 62. And uh, over there, you don't have a number. Do you have a number? I do have a What's number. What's your number? I don't have it here. I'm number 136. You are? Yeah. Okay, if you insist. Um, this, um, this panel came about as a result of um, uh, a discussion Rob and I had in Amsterdam last uh, winter, I believe, where we both drinking heavily at the time, or was it just a civilized conversation? I'm not sure how these things come about. I never drink, so... Okay. Well, maybe I was drinking heavily. I don't know. Um, basically, uh, 2,600 meetings began in 1987 uh, in New York, and they expanded to uh, cities like Philadelphia and San Francisco. And at, at some point, Washington, D.C., and then there was the the raid on the Washington DC meeting and that resulted in an explosion of meetings so we had meetings all over the world after that mm -hmm. and it's never really gone down and uh, the meetings are interesting they always take place on the first Friday of the month and basically people interested in the magazine or hacking in general or just getting together in a food court someplace uh, gather at that time and there have been a variety of positive and negative things and um, what well, we're gonna focus on both uh, this particular um, this particular panel, and of course we're open to suggestion and input and stories that you might have. So um, I guess, um, Rob, do you want to start or do you want to finish? Which way do you want to go? I'll finish. Okay, so we'll start over with, uh, well, Walter, do you want to start? Um, when did you first start coming to meetings? Where are the meetings you went to? Was uh, some yeah, I, things? I think I started coming to meetings a long time ago, maybe the uh, late, late 80s. When did the meetings start? 1987. Yeah, I think maybe uh, before the 90s, 89, 88, something like that. And uh, I remember my first meeting, I was running a BBS back in those days, and uh, I met Fiber Optic, and uh, apparently uh, he had uh, dialed into my BBS and he pulled my uh, records, and he, uh, I met him, and the first thing uh, he said is, you and my full name, and he pronounced it correctly, which is not easy, and uh, gave me my address. So it was very, uh, it was exciting. It was an exciting uh, and scary <laughs> meeting for me. He pulled your docs, eh? Yes. Wow. Uh, and uh, Jeopardy Jim here, you've been at many New York City meetings? Yeah, I, I started uh, coming to meetings in 1994, uh, just ahead of Hope, uh, the original one. And uh, I've attended, I'd say, about three quarters of them since then, including some of the more infamous ones, the, uh, the 60 Minutes expose where they tried to get us to talk about pictures of women and donkeys on the internet. Uh, the, the, the one where the uh, director and art director of Hackers came looking for information and Angelina Jolie, even at age 17, was too big a star to talk to us, so she just skated around City Course Center. You guys know that Angelina Jolie came to one of our meetings, isn't that something? Yeah, and it, it, it blew us off. <laughs> we, no, she we was nice. She was a nice kid. She, we uh, weren't as pretty as Brad Pitt, even then. The, this was when they were making... <laughs> Good one. After, the, after this panel, could all the women in the audience just beat that guy down? Good thing that was not off the hook. No, uh, she was actually very friendly. We uh, were doing some stuff with hackers, uh, advising them not to do certain things that they wound up doing anyway. And um, it's just kind of, kind of a, a mecca, I guess, for a lot of people that this is where the hackers are, right or wrong, they came to the meetings. The movie Hackers would never have been made without the New York City meeting because the guy who wrote it would show up at the meetings and get material and even even uh, handles 
from various attendees. So there are, there are people who came to the meetings who are in that movie, and he, he basically borrowed their characters. And um, I think there's some good and some bad in that, but it, it does make for some historical moments. And as Jim mentioned, Mike Wallace from 60 Minutes was at one of our meetings too, and he was interrogating us about various positions of donkeys and sexual poses. I don't know what the hell he was thinking, <laughs> why we had anything to do with this, but um, apparently that's his definition of hackers. Uh, Bernie here, in, it, when he was in Philadelphia, he went to the Philadelphia meetings, and um, well, I'm sorry to say, Probably a direct result of the Philadelphia 2600 meeting is what landed him in prison. Uh, well, I, is, is that a lead-in? I think that's a lead-in, <laughs> yeah. But uh, um, Well, in 87, actually, the first, 26, first 2600 meeting in Philadelphia was in 87, and it was uh, only three people showed up. Emmanuel, who tried to get it going, uh, myself, and uh, uh, Mike Uhas. Mike Uhas. That's right. Who knows, knew more area codes than anybody. And he knew all the area codes. Still does. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, and that was sort of a one-time thing, that Philadelphia meeting. Um, but about three years later, uh, I started the one at 30th Street, 30th Street Station in Philadelphia, under Stairwell 7. And that was very popular. A lot of people started showing up. A few months after it started, we had attendances uh, of up to 40 people uh, at that meeting. And it got so where I would be, I'd, I called uh, uh, Bell Atlantic Mobile Systems uh, technical department and got two, two Bell uh, cellular engineers to come and give us a presentation about how their cellular network works. And uh, we social engineered them into giving us some information about uh, where uh, some of their equipment was located, uh, several stories underground, 30th Street Station in the catacombs. And then uh, after the meeting, we all went down and explored and found the equipment. <laughs> It wasn't easy either, but you remember all those tunnels. We went down there another time. But they were, they were hot tunnels. Oh, too. man. It was like the Poseidon adventure. There were like steam <laughs> coming out and everything. And, but um, Has anyone here not explored a tunnel ever? It's the most awesome thing. To, and don't go on the tunnels there's, at the hotel. There's tunnels. Please. I was going to say, there's tunnels here, but don't go there. <laughs> now they're going to go there. <laughs> there's really cool tunnels at the hotel across the street. Go there. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the Philadelphia meetings uh, really took off well. And... And they, they went well for about mm, four years or so. And uh, it turns out uh, I was started bringing uh, quartz crystals and uh, unmodified touchtone dialers to that meeting and, uh, and uh, at the suggestion of someone at this table. <laughs> Just and, wait a minute. I suggested this? Well, he suggested that uh, we, it would be a public service to the hacking community. To, because they couldn't, it was really hard to get one of these crystals. So uh, I, managed, I, I contracted with a crystal manufacturer just to make a large batch of them uh, so we could be affordable. And be, be you guys know why one. the crystals were wanted? Oh, you yeah. know about the crystals? Yep. Not crystal meth. The crystals the, the, with yeah. magical power. <laughs> These are crystals with magical powers. The, the trick was that I can't take credit for. Um, there was a very good article in 2600. I forget who wrote it. But um, someone determined that the uh, touch tone frequencies were the ratio between the two tones in a touch tone frequency was almost identical to the ratio of the two tones used uh, by payphones to uh, signal a coin deposit to the central office. And if you just change the quartz crystal, the tiny crystal in the touch tone dialer, you could buy a Radio Shack or something, then uh, it would shift it to a frequency that was right within tolerance and you could like store five stars or asterisks in it and it would simulate the sound of a quarter going to a payphone sufficiently well enough to make a call. But anyway. You've all heard of the Radio Shack tone dialer thing. now. I, I forgot about this, that, that it actually was printed in 2600, and I, I guess that makes us responsible for this whole explosion. Actually, it is your fault. <laughs> uh, Mr. French, I think, was, uh, was the guy that did that. He was a guy I met on a voicemail system by accident, just by both of us hacking into the same voicemail system. He was in Texas, I was in New York, and he just wrote a letter one day saying, hey, guess what I discovered? And, 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 and the, the whole and telecom industry it was affected and by that. The fact that that, that that worked, that hack worked, was, as he wrote in the article, beyond luck. It was like a divine <laughs> in, intervention. I mean, there's, I mean, the chances of, of those two frequency ratios being so close were, you know, a million to one. So somebody was looking out for it. <laughs> but someone wasn't looking out for you. No, right? well, anyway, it turns out that, that one, one of the... Uh, people that, that attended the 2600 meeting in Philadelphia turned out to be a federal informant and ultimately uh, contacted the Secret Service um, after my initial arrest and gave them a lot of information about stuff I was, I was talking about at the meetings, none of which was uh, about fraud or anything. It was just simply about 
um, distributing these parts and, uh, and software and stuff, none of which was illegal at the time. I had done that at those meetings, but a new, a new federal statute had been enacted uh, just a few weeks before I was charged with it. And we can talk about that, the hackers in prison thing later. But the bottom line is uh, I haven't been to a 2600 meeting in Philadelphia since, uh, since about for about five years after I started it. I, I showed up to it after my whole prison experience, and sure enough, that federal informant um, was there. And I guess I can say his name, Paul Bergsman. <laughs> is he in the crowd? Paul Bergsman, raise your hand, There Paul. he is, okay, hey, Paul. how you doing? Go get What's him. What's your hotel room? <laughs> you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I'm, I'm a firm believer of not, uh, this is getting a little far afield, but I'm a firm believer of not naming other individuals in any kind of a, a, a case. You, it, it doesn't really, uh, help the situation and I take responsibility for your own actions and let the chips fall where they're going to fall because the government relies on this is a tirade of there's other the government relies on people ratting each other out and if you just just say talk to my lawyer everybody would, would have a much easier time but anyway um, back to the 2600 meetings uh, the Bell Atlantic systems engineers that showed up um, really gave some great technical presentations. We had engineers from uh, 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 local uh, insurance companies talking about their uh, their networks and so forth. And we, it was really like a seminar kind of thing. And uh, I, I haven't been to many meetings outside of uh, Philly and New York, but um, it's just so much knowledge gets spread around in a, in a casual way that um, it's not going to happen in, in any other kind of setting. And it just sort of have, it takes a life on of its own. Okay, uh, Lexicon from New York City, formerly from North Carolina. Um, I, I, um, I uh, started reading the magazine in, uh, about, I guess, mid-90s and uh, listening to the radio show and uh, thinking it would be great if there was a 2600 meeting near me. And uh, I was down in Wilmington, North Carolina, which is a fairly small beach community, and uh, there was not a 2600 meeting. And uh, so I put up a um, website, uh, nc2600.org, and um, said anybody in North Carolina who wants to do something with 2600, um, contact me. And I started hanging out on RC. And now we have, uh, I, I'm up here in New York now, but we have uh, last month 22 people showed up in Raleigh for the meeting, which is a pretty good number for a uh, meeting way out of New York City and Philadelphia, just a small place in the south. So um, we just kind of kept things snowballing by um, having point of presence kind of thing where we're on IRC and we're on the web and you can find people and talk to people and ask questions and before you go to the meeting find out what it's about and uh, hitting the magazines with flyers to get people to, you know, go into Barnes & Noble, stick a half-page flyer in the magazine that says, this is where the local meeting is, we're actually here, come to it. And uh, just building that sort of thing to build bigger and bigger meetings so more people who would be interested in it know that it's there. And so uh, that's mostly what we've been doing. And then um, in last year, we put together CarolinaCon, which is a conference that's like a super meeting for all the meetings in North Carolina. And we had people come from all over the place to show up to that. And it's like a kind of mini hope just for our state putting it together. And that was a lot of fun, so we did it again. And we'll probably do Carolina CarolinaCon 3 uh, next June. So that's it. Okay. Uh As I, I mentioned earlier, I had a conversation with Rob over the uh, winter, and it, uh, I, I think it's very important for us to take a critical look at what it is we do and analyze just why it is we do these things. And it was a great discussion because we're pretty much tearing the meetings apart. Like, are they worthwhile? Is this something good or something bad? What's the, what are the negative things that come out of it? How do we make it something positive? And I'd like for Rob to make some of those points again because they, they really are worth looking at. Well, to start off with, I haven't been to that many meetings, but I've been to some over the years. I'm here maybe once a year, once every two years, and I guess I've always been to at least one meeting when I was with, with you on Long Island. Um, we've been to some of the first meetings in California, I think they were. Uh, uh, Emmanuel, help me out here. We went to the San Francisco, San Francisco. one in... In, in, and in Barcadero. Then to, uh, we went to the... Uh, in Barcadero Center, and then to Los Angeles, and to one in San Diego. Los Angeles, which, I think we had two people show up. It was very yeah. small at the time. Yeah, I, at least in one of those cities it was the very first meeting, I think. Mm -hmm. So we, 
I, I was there for, for the, the California trip and then through the years went to some meetings in New York and, and to be totally honest, I'm, I can't stand shopping malls. So that's a big part of, a, t a totally big part of me hating the meetings, but I really don't, don't like them. They're not my thing. Um, that's just me personally. I'm not sure that that matters to anybody else. But I also think shopping malls are a really bad place for, for, for doing stuff like this. It's, it, it makes the community look like a bunch of geeks hanging out at some, uh, the, 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 I don't know. It, it just, to me, it doesn't feel right. But that's maybe just me, but it just feels very silly and stupid. Um, even if good things are happening there, even if, if, if the perfect people got together and had the perfect conversations, um, I would still feel sort of, what am I doing here? This is artificial light, I'm in some stupid, this is security card passing by every 30 seconds. Dude, that's America. <laughs> no, not necessarily. I don't see a security guard passing by me here every 30 seconds, so. Where's when, Big Frank, there are. <laughs> um, you are under surveillance. Yeah, I know. Um, How many cameras and it's, are out it's there part right of that. But I've I've been when I was hanging around on bulletin boards in in the 80s and uh, was trying to get to meet people and there was nothing there. There were no structures. There was nothing there. It was important to meet some some place in town to use public places to to get in contact with people. Um, I'm not so sure it's that useful now. I'm 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 not so sure that it's it wouldn't be more useful if. If there was more structure to it, if there, if it was less of a, um, how shall I say it? Just um, I'm trying to find the the proper English terms for it. But um, an agenda, perhaps. Well, an agenda would be nice, but but it's not always necessary. But but uh, more of a sense of being in your own space, and not so much a sense of being a bunch of kids hanging around and being obnoxious, even because. That's not what we are. We are not a bunch of kids hanging around being obnoxious, so why pretend? Why? Maybe that's just me getting older. Maybe that's just me being... I don't know if that's just a generational shift or if part of that is, is, is the form that is chosen. And, in, and the question for me is, in, to what extent does the form we choose define who we are? Does it make us a bunch of obnoxious kids because we choose the form of being obnoxious kids? Well, let's, let's analyze this and see where the problem is, because I can see both sides of this issue. First question, quick question to the audience. Be honest, if you have never attended a 2600 meeting, please quickly show your hands. Okay, that's wow. at least a quarter of this audience. Let me describe a 2600 meeting as it occurs in New York. We meet in the atrium of the City Car Center. City it's Group not Center. They changed the name, a City Group Center. Wow. Get with it, Jim. It's not quite a shopping mall. There are shops around, but not too many. It's more like a food court, but even that's inaccurate. There's about 30 tables, 120, 200 chairs. And there is not what you would call a structure to a 2600 meeting. People go, sit down, br bring out a laptop perhaps, bring out some other piece of equipment, a Unix book, whatever, sit there. And there's no necessary identifying tag on anyone. So if you've never been to one, you don't exactly spot the meeting too easily. This may or may not be a good thing. But also, as I said, there is no agenda. There's no scheduled speaker usually, despite the uh, ex rare example given by Bernie S. There's no set topics of discussion that have been posted on IRC or a website. It just exists. People know that it's in a given location, on a given date, for a given time. That's it. And what you get out of it is what you make of it. Ideally, you go, you find somebody with an interesting piece of equipment in front of them or an interesting book, and you get into a conversation. This is not good for the shy retiring type, which a lot of geeks, frankly, are. So, you know, there's something to be said for trying to make it into a more organized uh, activity. I, I think maybe it's, it's a bit of a misnomer to call them meetings, even. They're more like gatherings. Because, as Jim said, there are no real agendas. I know there are some meetings that do try to have agendas, and that's fine. But when we first started the meetings, it was basically, we want to get people away from computers and out of their houses so that they actually meet each other and do something a bit social and um, you know, get some oxygen. It would be kind of, kind of a nice thing. 
and um, that's that's sort of what we've tried to maintain. But yeah, it's it's um, it, it can be kind of disorganized. It can be kind of chaotic, and I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Well, the the thing I I witnessed on on the me at the meetings that I was at is also there's there's not one group, but there's like four or five, and out of these four or five groups, two or three hate each other, or uh, uh, try to run away from each other. And are you, you applauding the hatred, or what exactly are you applauding? Uh, <laughs> you, get pe you get people following other people around. You get these crazy, uh, or at least that's what I've, I've observed. You get crazy sort of... Uh, uh, smoke less ash. <laughs> I don't smoke any. Uh, no, but there's... Uh, uh, Lots of kids that want to learn something about computer security or something about hacking, running around asking anybody that might know, "Can you teach me how to hack?" or "Can you do this?" or, and and there, there's this, there's no, um, there's no structure to deal with this. So people keep keep being pushed away. So there's this this, and that leads to to social awkwardness, and it leads to people not getting answers or not being told. Well, maybe you can be taught how to do computer security things, but maybe we should, you should learn some other things as well. And then they end up hanging around with some other kids that have already learned a little bit. So does this not breed script kiddies? Does this not, I mean, if, there's, if you're gonna get all these people together and then you're not gonna have the, the sort of organizedness about you to tell them or, or, or to, to receive them in some kind of structure where you tell them, well, this is who we are or this is what, we, what we'd like to be, then, then what are, what are we? Then what is that? That's a hierarchy and a lot of people resent hierarchies. So it's kind of a, a, kind of a catch-22 because, yeah, then you have to be the person that knows the answers. And yeah, people keep telling me that's, that's but then, then we would be excluding people. Mm -hmm. or, but now you're also excluding people. You're excluding the people that can't deal with that anymore and that just leave because it's stupid. That's also being exclusive. Hey. You just want to um, I tend to agree to a certain extent that uh, <laughs> That, that some of the meetings uh, can take on a, a, a an air of uh, mm, just. I'm sorry. <laughs> Didn't hear that. You take an air of uh, of uh, immaturity, and but you know sometimes you're dealing with a lot of young people too, um, and who, who haven't who haven't uh, you know. But especially if you're dealing with young people, uh, you can either. Present yourself and, and sort of sort of give them a structure to grow up in, or you can you can create this this sort of unhealthy cult of personality thing. You can create people running after other people. Uh, there, there's there's different ways of dealing with lots of young people showing up. Yeah, and that's that's what we try to avoid is to create cults of personality and cliques and things like that. It's it's difficult because yeah, you do have warring factions and stupidity like that. And when we hear about that shit, we just we, we delist the meeting because we're not interested in that. We're interested in people meeting each other and working it out. And if you're too immature to do that, you really shouldn't be meeting. I mean, I agree with that totally. And this may be m more an American thing than uh, than and globally because there's meetings that are held around the world. Uh, 2,600 gatherings, and we haven't really heard much of that yeah. sort of stuff going on in, in these other cities. And I can name some of the other cities, like Barcelona, to, Moscow. Yeah. I've been to the meeting in London, I've been to the meeting in Prague, and these guys are really, um, you know, mature and well-behaved, and they're, they're talking about various things and listening to each other. And I'm not saying they don't do that here, because I've seen many good meetings here, but I have seen a lot of stupidity, and it's... Yeah, we're a product of our culture, I think, and that's that's a sad thing. I just don't know if we have the power to change that ourselves. I think you do. I, I think you just have to accept that, that that the structure, the places, the venues of the meetings themselves, all of that defines what the meetings are. Mm -hmm. And if you're not willing to make changes, or if you're not willing to have different kinds of meetings, or if you're not willing to have meetings in different places, or experiment with creating some kind of structure that, that gives some kind of message to the new people that arrive there. I mean, even if you have to type out three sheets, uh, uh, three sheets of paper and just give it to people or whatever, if, you, if you're not willing to have any kind of structure, you just let people swim. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, you're here. Well, we don't care. 
Uh, well, I mean, we do have the meeting well, you guidelines. You want to know stuff. Well, well, we've got you, the meeting uh, guidelines that tell you know what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, uh, what people should expect. Yeah, but actually, I, I I attempted that once in uh, in I guess it was uh, around ninety ninety four. Uh, passed out a, a sort of a, a sheet of paper with guidelines and the structure of what you know the kind of topics that uh, uh, would be might be more interesting. Uh, to discuss and uh, appropriate behavior rules of the, the at the 30th Street station, as far as what they were allowed to do. Ironically, one of the rules is a uh, uh, no, you can't pass out any handbills. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the, uh, the, the the Amtrak uh, Federal Police descended on us uh, for doing just that. Even though these are, I was handing out these to people I knew. They weren't being handed out to strangers. So uh, they tried to kick us out of the place and. Uh, uh, so then I went to the local city paper and said, you know, and, and they made a story about it, saying, you know, um, you know, these are these are people that are showing up to, to patronize some of the new businesses at the station because the, the Philadelphia just put all these like uh, shops and coffee shops and bookstores and stuff at the train yes. station, and uh, so uh, that was around the time that uh, a, a friend of mine had uh, uh, brought to my attention some p potential surveillance of the 2600 meeting by other law enforcement agencies, namely the Secret Service. And we, we'd sort of wondered, like, who are these guys standing around at the meetings that in suits or just they, look, looking at us but not part of the meeting kind of thing. So um, through one way or another, I came into possession of some uh, surveillance photographs of some of these uh, Secret Service undercover agents, who we believed were. We weren't sure. And I took them to the next meeting. Well. The local TV, uh, the Fox TV, Fox Television affiliate in Philadelphia, uh, had read the newspaper article uh, about a month before about us being harassed at the meeting, and uh, they showed up to do a story with cameras. It just so happened that I had brought pictures of these uh, Secret Service agents to that meeting and had taped them on the wall, and was a. Uh, pointing them out to uh, attendees saying, if you see these guys, uh, they are more than likely law enforcement and more than likely Secret Service. Turns out I was right. Um, <laughs> because about a year later, when my, uh, my federal case started, uh, I got a, a severe uh, vituperation by two Secret Service agents for having made public uh, their faces on the local television news because they were operating undercover and uh, apparently not very well. <laughs> They were also uh, picking their noses, weren't they? Oh yeah, they, they, it sort of added to the to the to the uh, to the drama that these pictures had them like picking their noses and looking unprofessional, and so they, and they told me point blank that they took a lot of heat for 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 that, not for picking their noses, I guess, but for just getting their covers blown on the evening news. Um, they got even, and uh, uh, but you know you got to wonder about surveillance at meetings and uh, federal informants and and that sort of thing, but. I, I just don't go to the meetings anymore in Philadelphia, um, but that's just my choice. I don't think there, I don't think there uh, is good reasons for other people not to go. I just had a bad experience that had nothing to do with most of the crowd there, um, and I've gone to meetings in uh, in other parts of the country that weren't that weren't like that at all. So I don't know. I don't. I don't think the kind of situations I ran into are, are going to be that common, but I hope not anyway. <laughs> We, we generally get a lot of mail from people running the meetings that tell us various things that happen. Some of them are very detailed. They say where they went to eat afterwards and stuff we really don't need to know, but um, it's nice to hear it. Um, and we always get lots of, um, lots of people wanting to start new meetings. Uh, too many, in fact. People want to start meetings in small towns with 50 people. And it's great, but we just can't list every single place that wants to have a meeting. Um, so we pretty much say, you know, any food court on Friday evening, first Friday of the month, maybe there's a meeting there, and, and we'll list the biggest ones uh, in the biggest cities. Otherwise, the whole magazine will be uh, meeting listings. Uh, but I've I've heard lots of stories from people who have who have formed partnerships and companies and designed things based on people they have met at meetings. And um, I have to say, I think the positive outweighs the negative. But I know there is negative. I know there is uh, some out of control people that exist to disrupt meetings. I know that happens. I know there are plenty of um, narcs and feds and cops and things like that. It's one of the reasons we meet in public, though. But on the other hand, I've got to say that I've, I've met some really interesting pe people at 2600 meetings who've, who have remained uh, long-term friends. I mean, years and years um, that have, you know, we've been able to bring other contacts into each other's lives that have really enriched our lives tremendously. Uh, with that kind of chemistry, and uh, you know, there's all kinds of 
avenues in my life that opened up in a positive standpoint from people that I met at 2600 meetings. And uh, it's really amazing that, that, that it worked out that way. And it scares the shit out of the feds too because we meet at the same time all around the world and they can't possibly send people everywhere <laughs> at once. And that's always been one of the magical things about the meetings is just they think we're so well organized that we have chapters all over the place and they don't realize it's just really disorganized a bunch of people just meeting in malls and food courts. Now on the topic of malls and food courts, yeah, you know, I don't really like those places either, but there aren't that many places that you can meet other than street corners. I mean, you can go to like a meeting place with uh, chairs and desks and things like that, but uh, I don't know if that's the atmosphere most people are looking for. Maybe it is. I also don't want to exclude people by having meetings in bars and things like that, which some people like to do. Yeah, but you are excluding people. Well, they're excluding themselves by not coming, but nobody, nobody is, is forbidden from coming to meetings. I'm not sure that's still the case, but when I was at the New York 2600 meetings, there was always two or three people that were very, very obvious criminal elements that were, in my mind, had nothing to do with, with hacking the spirit of hacking or anything. They're just... And that, that continues to this day. But they're, the thing is, we can't exclude those people. We can Why teach not? people to be smart and... Why uh, not? Because, well, because we're in a public place. Yeah, it's a public place. Yeah, I know, but, but isn't that then a stupid move? I'm if just we, wondering. I'm just publicly wondering. I, I don't know. I don't know if I have the answer. Mm -hmm. I'm just... I don't want to necessarily uh, share my knowledge with people. I don't want to have to run away from a conversation because it's joined by people that I know to be criminals. Well, here's the thing. That I know to have no regards whatsoever for any of the, of the ideological or, or social things that I come from and just want to turn around and sell whatever I tell them or, or use it to rip somebody off or hurt somebody. Or, and mm -hmm. that bothers me. And I, if, if, if we as a community uh, cannot somehow get rid of two or three people that, that, that have nothing in common with us. I mean, we might as well, we try to get rid of the, of, the, of the feds, we try to get rid of the secret service, we try to make fun of them, we try to... We, we, we uh, don't try to get rid of them from the meetings. In fact, if they're at the meetings, we talk to them and ask them lots of questions, and they don't like that, but we do it anyway. And it's no, but it's like you have, it's this, you have this whole thing going with, with the narcs, the feds, the, the cops, the, but, but at the same time, you're giving them exactly what they want. What they want. You're, you're, you're giving them an atmosphere in which you can be portrayed as hanging out with a bunch of criminals. You're giving them the, 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 the context. Well, it also gives them the impression the that pretext. we have nothing to hide. Yeah. All right? We're willing to talk to anybody. Uh, we're willing to talk to the feds. We're willing to talk to the criminals. We have nothing to hide. What we have is information. Information is, uh, the, the, the gist of information is all in how it's used. All right, you can use it for good or evil. All right, and that is what makes the information good or evil unto itself. All right, if you have uh, questions or anything, there's two microphones. Oh boy, look at that. Oh, uh, um, before, before the <laughs> questions, I just want to say something on, on what Emmanuel said about getting letters from people who have formed companies and such. If you meet someone at a 2600 meeting and form the next Google or Microsoft, please consider underwriting uh, the next Hope Conference. It's only about six digits worth of advertising. It could be worth a fortune to you. Okay, let's start with uh, you. All right, I have a lot of relevant things to say. I'll try to be quick, though. But um, I'm 545 or uh, Logic, uh, just representing Phoenix meetings there. Uh, we don't meet at, a, at a, a food court. We actually meet at an underground coffee shop. It's called Counterculture Cafe. Um, we have pretty good attendance. Uh, the, like the meeting before last month, there was about 40 people that showed up. Uh, we have had feds come. We've had the FBI come. We've asked them questions even, found out some interesting stuff. Uh, what else? Um, and as far as suggestions or just uh, another point of view, uh, the most successful thing that we've had is that there is no elitism, there is no infighting, and we prioritize to uh, keep that out. And also as far as clicks and everything, we avoid that. We make How sure- How do you do that? We talk to everybody. We make sure to include everybody. Um, if somebody is kind of sitting around but we know that they're part of the meeting, we'll engage them in conversation. We'll make sure that we'll find out what their interests are. We'll try to, because we're all so diverse, which is also helpful too. We all have stuff to share. Um, because yeah, nobody really likes somebody that says they know a lot but can't share it intelligibly. So, that's great. Cool. So. Sounds like you have a good meeting. 
uh, the first person at the second microphone so that nobody gets left out. Okay. Go ahead. It's not working. It's on. Oh, is that Hello? Rebel? It's not on. Oh, hi, Rebel. <laughs> so I couldn't see, or I wouldn't have said that otherwise. Okay, go ahead. All right, yeah. I started going to the meetings at, um, I guess it was 92, the, the first meeting. <laughs> Speak into the microphone. Uh, um, what I like about the meetings is that if you if you're, uh, want to know something like how, how things work, like if your computer is broken or something's not working, you ask somebody at the 2600 meeting first. You don't go to the store and ask them because they'll tend to give you the runaround. Hackers tend to know how things work and they can give you details. <laughs> All right, but it's not only that, but it's, they can explain to you, they can give you analogies, they can explain to you how things work in a way you can understand. That's what I like about the meetings. And I think that the meetings, you know, that's what the meetings are for, to, to, to get together and to ask people, you know, if something's not working and, you know. And Rebel has been coming to the New York City meetings? Since about 1992. Familiar face. And, and you know, being that things don't work anymore like they used to, like in the early 90s, like, you know, uh, like when I first started coming to the meetings, a lot of, I would, you know, I remember, you know, fiber optic would, you know, tell, I would tell people how things work about telephones and, and I just share knowledge and it was just a lot of information. But now that the things that used to work then not, don't work now, you know, but there's still a lot of things to talk about, I guess. But, I mean, it's technical, but if, you, if you're not that technical, I guess it's, it's good to Okay, thank you. Okay. Next. Good job. <laughs> Hi, guys. How's it going? Hey. Uh, I want to tell you my favorite things about 2600 meetings. Um, one of my favorite things is that almost all of the cool people I've ever met in my entire life, I met at 2600 meetings. So I have to say thank you for that. You poor thing. <laughs> 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 um, I have to say that um, some of the meetings out there are really, really cool meetings. Uh, we used to do a meeting in Boulder, and it was amazing. We'd go on field trips and projects together. Almost everyone, every time, someone would bring something that they wanted to figure out, or, oh, I have this book. It's cool. We'll check it out. <laughs> now I'm talking about 720. Uh, 720 represent. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and I want to tell you what I think about them. Um, I think meeting people that have common interests with you is really awesome. And in fact, everywhere I go, not just 2600 meetings, every conference I go to, every meeting in, not in the United States I go to, I get to meet people like that and I like them. So it's just another avenue that you can do that. But um, in these other places, we get to be a little more productive than we can be at 2600 meetings. Obviously, it's hard to get some kind of project done if you're in a mall. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so, so my favorite people that I've met through places like this are people who actually yes. work on projects. <laughs> um, 720, uh, my meeting in Boulder, that's the area code, that's our little slang term for it, was really fun and it died. It ended, there's no more 720 meetings. There hasn't been for about two years, three years since I moved here. And so it takes somebody who's really in charge of a meeting to really make sure it works out. We don't have any kind of national infrastructure to rely on, right? We don't have any kind of organization to give us resources to do projects, to make sure that the meetings continue even if somebody moves away. Well, what kind of resources do you think would work? Well, there's all kinds of resources. There's um, friends in the press, right? This, I'm quoting Rob from his earlier talk. Now, there's, um, there's money, of course. Money makes the world go around. If we had you know, some way to get equipment or get whatever, we could work on cool projects, whatever. Um, it's cool that the meetings are all on the same Friday everywhere around the world, but we are just a couple of guys <laughs> sitting around and just doing a couple things. If we really wanted to have a political impact anywhere, we can't do that because <laughs> we're just a couple of guys sitting around yeah. different places who don't really communicate to each other. Um, <clears throat> I think there are other ways to get the good things that come out of 2600 meetings. If we had a space, for example, the way they do in Germany, to work on things, to do projects, to invite people in, to show them our space, we don't have to worry about feds anymore, and we can get respect from the press and the public by doing what we do instead of hanging out with criminals. 
um, we can invite the criminals in, we can invite the feds in, we can invite everyone in, and they're on our space, they're on our turf, and we can tell them and ask them anything we want. And having a good face in the press is a better way to have nothing to hide. Um, <laughs> okay. I, that's it. Back microphone? Yes, I'm not exactly sure how unique Chicago 2600 is, but um, we had a unique situation where um, we used to be meeting at Union Station downtown. And uh, things got very hostile there with the people that we were, that we were actually having the meeting with. So uh, several of us had the opportunity to go to a neighborhood boys and girls club and basically essentially build their infrastructure, their network infrastructure there. So we moved all the meetings over there. We now have a space that we can basically meet from 7 p.m. to about 5 or 6 in the morning, typically on Friday nights. Also, we have, you know, monthly, we have on the meetings, you know, we have monthly talks. We do have structure to it. Um, we actually, the first, the first meeting, the first time that we actually had someone talk was actually a guy from Sourcefire talked about IDS systems. And then after that, we even bothered to invite one of the feds. Of course, they didn't bother to come by. However, you know, we at least invited them. We let them know that they were there. Um, I think that we, we've kind of made headway in all those areas you're saying that, we're, that, that 2600 itself is lacking in the meetings. And you know, I'd be happy to offer some input on some of the things that we have done. Okay. Um, I mean, lastly, I'd have to say that you know, we do average probably about 40, 40 to 45 members every month too. So if that does kind of help that we have brought back from like 12 people back at Union Station to about 40 to 50. So it can happen. Good. How you guys doing? Um, I'm, though being a resident of New York, I uh, haven't had a chance to get to 2,600 meetings in New York City, and for that I feel really bad. Um, <laughs> later. Um, <laughs> but um, I agree with Rob. Uh, Rob. When Rob? With a P. With a P. Oh, I'm sorry. My apologies. Um, I'll live. In that, that, <laughs> in that, you know, we do have to deal with those people, you know, as he puts it, the criminal elements who don't care at all about trying to further knowledge, trying to further people knowing more than they did before they went to a meeting, who just want to use the information to get credit card numbers and, and, and social security numbers and wreak havoc in that way. But I also agree with Jim in that, you know, the information has to be put out there at 2600 meetings and that, you know, someone comes in and starts talking about, you know, the ins and outs of like free BSD. One person will use that to, you know, use free BSD on their system and have an absolutely wonderful time using free BSD. Uh, and the other person is going to use it and find out exploits in it and start screwing around and messing it up for everyone. You know, I also agree with um, the lovely lady who was in front of me who said that, you know, if we had the kind of, um, you know, good press where we could go and say, you know what, these people did these things, they're not us. Because honestly, as technology has evolved, so have we. We're no longer just simply hackers. Now we're network security enthusiasts, hardware, enth hardware enthusiasts, computer enthusiasts. So, you know... Hackers has become a, a bit of an archaic term to describe who we are, you know, and as such, you know, the, the structure of the meetings does need to change, you know, I think that both at the meeting level and also at the, at the highest level, you know, using, utilizing the website to be able to, you know, to better organize things at that level, using the meetings themselves, you know, like when Bernie had Bell Atlantic people come, you know, not making that so structured and so organized that we start calling attention to ourselves you know before we're ready to say we're not like this anymore but you know in such a way that we invite people people who are kind of interested in computers like I am mm -hmm. but never really had uh, an arena or a forum to enter hmm? okay there's like yeah, right. seven different people yeah, waiting yeah. okay all right thanks uh, thanks for your input we do have a lot of people we'd like to get to, so try to make your comments as, as quickly as possible and uh, in the back now. Okay, I actually have a question. Um, suppose that a decision is made that you want to change the format of the meetings, that you want to make the uh, meetings more restrictive. What is your ultimate recourse? I mean, the only thing you can really do is delist the meeting. 
And the second thing is, say that you, you, you know you decide to make these changes. Who's involved in the decision-making process? Is it just where, you know, you, Emmanuel, will say, well, these are the meeting guidelines, this is how it is, and if you don't like it, we're delisting the meeting? So I just wanted to answer that two-part question. Well, that's, that's definitely a, a problem that we're facing all the time. We don't want to take too much control uh, from a place that we're not even there. You know, we don't know what goes on in Sioux City. Maybe uh, the way they structure meetings there works differently than it does in Boston. We like to leave it up to the individual group to do this and leave it as open as possible. But I, I, mean, I hear all the, all the problems that can arise from having it to be uh, too open a structure. I like to think that the meetings themselves are kind of like the first contact that you have with people from there. You can take the next step and say, okay, we want to do a project with you. Meet us at a space that we have and let's build something together. But I don't want to create something where there's a... Um, a national controlling body someplace that's remote from the actual location where you guys are working because I think there's no substitute for you doing that yourselves. Do you have something else to come? Yeah, um, one of the, the best things that I think you can do if you have like more than eight people showing up at, up at a 2600 meeting is to form a nonprofit organization uh, among the people that you want to hang out with in the group and that's going to cost you about 200 bucks in most states and you can use that to take donations and all sorts of things and get a lab space and all sorts North Carolina 2600 just got started a lab and uh, it's it's like a 12 by 12 room with a T1 line so <laughs> and a huge mirror but um, nonprofit organizations are a great way to build your meeting and to build it in the direction that you want it to go because the 2600 meeting is a great starting place, it's a great nexus, but it, changing it to fit your needs doesn't necessarily work because it's no longer a 2600 meeting. But you can do second or third Friday of the month mm. as your nonprofit group or something else where you get the people that you want to get together together to do what you want to do. Okay. I'm Pan, I'm from Ann Arbor. I just wanted to point out that I think Rob has some good points because I think uh, meeting in food courts and places that are so plastic and consumer oriented uh, and also sort of youth oriented in a certain way can be limiting and sort of they, they l limit the perception of us to the outside world as being the young kids that hang out at the mall and blah 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 blah. So I think moving them or allowing people to think of other places or encouraging them well, might be interesting. You do have that, that power. I mean, the people at the meetings are the ones who pick the place. We don't tell people to meet in food courts. Yeah, but, I th I, but it's become sort of an unspoken rule, I think. Oh, whether, whether you under No, I, I disagree with that, actually. Yeah, I, think I, I would love I, it if everybody moved out of the food courts, totally. But uh, we need to find better places. Well, then maybe a good thing might be for people to start dis having discussions and pass those ideas on to other groups. I mean, I think what the guys in Chicago meetings. did is, is, is perfect. I think that's exactly yeah. the solution. To so maybe talking like between meetings about different ways might be good. All right. Thank you. Now in the back. Um, yes. I want to I wanna quickly, just a second. Uh, the, the guy before this gentleman over here um, said something about forming a separate meeting on the second or the third Friday of the month and then hanging out with the people that you want to hang out with which to me sounds just like an institutionalized form of what I see happening here in New York, which is groups of people running away and trying to shove away the other kids that keep showing up, which is, <clears throat> I'm not saying that's wrong, I'm just saying it's, it's, it's a consequence of what's happening. And no, I'm not sure, I'm not well, sure that means anything, I'm just saying it's an institutionalized form of the same thing. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's no real different from, um, from saying these guys are criminal elements, let's get away from them. Mm. We know what we're doing, they don't, let's get the negative influence out. I mean, you meet people at a meeting, you're free to socialize with them further later on and do things, and well, that's what we provide, not, not more I know than that. the German model where the Germans just have a club. Guys, can we have a little bit more quiet and keep it, the discussion a little bit more centralized? Excuse me. Shut up back there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and we only have about two minutes, so let's wrap it up. Okay. The Germans have a club, and the Germans are, are, it's not like anybody can just come by and, 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 and take over the club or be part of the club. It's, it's more of, an, of a, 
a system of vetting and a system of, of who we want to be part of the club and not be part of the club. And here, the, the same mechanism is needed and it's somehow implicitly created which leads to lots of people running away from other people and lots of awkward scenes. I mean, I've been together with you, running away from other parts of the meeting, jumping on subway trains, <laughs> jumping turnstiles, getting... I mean, it's the same mechanism, it's just a more immature way of getting to it. In Those are lunatics we're running away from. I know. <laughs> okay, That's my point. Let's try and get two more in. Who spoke last? First mic or second back mic? Back microphone we should get to. Okay, back, back microphone, then the front, and that's really all we have time for, I'm sorry. Um, we can't I bend time. Charles. I'm one of the people who speak up, went to his, um, My name is Charles. I'm one of the people who went to his first. Closer to the mic. Yeah, and everybody else, keep it down a little bit. Thank you. Sorry. My name is Charles. I'm one of the people who went to his first 2600 meeting uh, last year after Hope. Um, I've been in the community for a while. It's just I avoided meetings, and so I decided that last year I'd finally go to a 2600 meeting. Um, I did, I have to agree with you on that. I did feel a little bit uncomfortable. I'm, I'm okay with the meeting place, but it was more of, there was a kind of a class system going on, hidden within the meeting. I mean, Manuel himself told me to get off my ass and walk around the room and try to meet, meet people. So I did, and I still felt a little uncomfortable because I'm 32 years old, and I still felt a little uncomfortable coming here for the first time, and uh, some of the people just turned me off a little bit. Is there any way, I mean, I read the guidelines first before showing up, too. Is there any other way you could suggest we could make it a little bit more easier for newcomers, people coming for there's, the first time? There's really, as far as I can see, no way to make it real easy for newcomers, because in any social situation, Familiarity breeds familiarity, unlike uh, the saying goes. The more you show up, the more you're accepted. Even if you are off in a corner, just because people see your face more often, they'll get used to you and you're more accepted, you're more likely to get talked to. The only reason I talked to anybody in my first uh, meeting was because I had something that Emmanuel wanted and vice versa. But other than that, just keep showing up. and Sooner or later, it will work. I know that sounds like lame advice, but it's true. Okay, we only have time Thank for you. one more, it's going to be you. Yeah, I've been going to 2,600 meetings now since 1999. Um, a lot of great, met a lot of great people there. Uh, a lot of great things happened. Um, been to pretty much all the hopes. A lot of people here know me. Um, a lot of people remember me from uh, a week ago when I dumped the drink on Emmanuel's head. And I still got in! Hoo-yah! Network pimps. I'm wearing a security shirt. And security! No shirts in here yet. <laughs> Good hack, I'll give you that. I didn't dump anything on your head. Okay, yeah, I think we're done with, uh, no, with meeting stuff. We have time for more. Uh, well, if there's one more, it should be the person in the back. Is the next panel I think, here? I think it should. They're pointing at